Hello and welcome to Grad Chat by PhD Balance, where we talk about topics of grad school beyond academic research and that may be more difficult to talk about in our day to day. I'm your host, Linda, and I'm currently finishing up my master's in food science in Ireland. And for PhD Balance, I'm the Grad Chat lead and a Twitter coordinator. Don't forget to subscribe to Grad Chat on your chosen platform to get notifications about new episodes. And if you feel like it, maybe leave us a rating or review. It helps people find the show and um, we love new listeners. Our topic today is building transferable skills and I'm si excited to welcome our guest Elena Rutula. Originally from Greece, Elena moved it into the UK six years ago to pursue further studies. Her educational background has been in chemical engineering, but after 10 years of chem engineering studies, including a PhD on the topic, she realized that her passion was not about the practice of the profession as a researcher or industrial engineer. During her PhD in chemical engineering, she discovered an interest in teaching, researchers development, science communication, networking and employability through participation in numerous extracurricular activities. Her non-research interests range from teaching assistance and participation in outreach to chairing committees and an editorial placement in the journal Nature. Wow, very impressive. <laughs> she decided to pave her way in a sector differently than originally intended by pursuing further experience and employment in areas of interest. Currently, her main focus is educating students and researchers on the realization and development of transferable skills and extracurricular experiences as a means to shape and pursue conventional and unconventional careers. Welcome. Um, how are you? <laughs> what an impressive bio. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, very nice, very, very glad to be here. Thank you so much for having me. I am well, I am well. Uh, mind you, it's Friday afternoon, evening almost, and I'm really in need for a weekend break. So yeah, but generally I'm fine. <laughs> But that's good. We love when people, <laughs> people are fine. Um, but it's also okay not to be fine all the time. So get that message across too. But great that you are. <laughs> um, so I guess diving right in, um, what are transferable skills? <laughs> so transferable skills are skills that we're developing during our experiences, any sort of experiences during education, work experience, anything. And they're not technical skills. So they're not necessarily taught through a module or through a textbook, but they're skills that we are picking up. And they're skills that are transferred across uh, disciplines, across sectors, across experiences, across uh, work environments. And they're skills that we build and they follow us for life. For example, communication, networking, interpersonal skills, uh, how to manage people, how to manage expectations, both our expectations and other people's expectations and loads of other skills in that list. And they're very important because in my opinion, they kind of, well, they shape who, I, who, who we are. And also they help us so much with career progression, with finding a career, with getting jobs, because at the end of the day, there's so many graduates of whatever professions, but what sets them apart is their experiences and their transferable skills and the level of expertise in their skills. Awesome. What an awesome definition and what an awesome introduction to what we're going to be talking about today. I think that's really, really great. And it really sets the scene. And so I guess you kind of explained why transferable skills are important. So um, why don't we talk about your experience of building transferable skills, if you'd like to? Yes, absolutely. I am more than happy to talk about my experience with transferable skills because I think it's um, eye-opening and I think that a lot of people that don't understand more about transfer transferable skills and especially at like levels of PhD where there's too much of a focus on a specific expertise people usually neglect that part of uh, skills development and it's unfortunate because as I said before it counts so much towards job hunting and majority of people are getting jobs because of their transferable or employability, if you want to call it like that, skills or soft skills, which in reality, it's so hard to develop them. Uh, yes, despite their technical background. So my experience, I wasn't always, well, I wasn't always aware about transferable skills. I wasn't always passionate about transferable skills. I guess my experience with this area starts in my PhD. As you said during my intro, I, I'm a chemical engineer. I still identify as a chemical engineer at some parts of the day, at least. 
And I studied in Greece. I am from Greece. I studied chemical engineering in Greece. And back then, nothing else on chemical engineering. And then I moved in the UK to pursue a master's in sustainability. And that went fine. And then I decided to do a PhD because why not? So I moved, I moved to cities in the UK and started my PhD, which was, guess what, on chemical engineering. It was on the interface of chemistry, materials, biocatalysis, and chemical engineering into designing products. And I realized that chemical engineering and research is not my passion. <laughs> that, that realization came almost in my second year or something, something like that. Because although I was passionate about being in the lab and doing exciting things and pushing barriers, scientific barriers, uh, it, it wasn't always making me happy. And especially the, the failure in research, which is a very, very common issue, reality in research, really. It, I, I couldn't handle it. My personality couldn't really take it. I, would, I was taking it very, very personally. And I, yeah, it, it wasn't a very good uh, period for me. So I decided to do stuff outside my PhD to actually give me a break and get some time away from the failure, if you want to call it that way. And that's when I got involved with lots of extracurricular activities. For example, I was uh, a graduate teaching assistant. I was assisting lecturers with their modules, module delivery in the labs, assisting students. I was I participated in various committees across my department, the faculty and the university. I also chaired a network, the Early Career Researchers Network. I chaired that for a year. I organized events, organized conferences. I participated in conferences. And basically, I did everything I could to spend time away from my PhD. And that sounds counterintuitive because I actually finished my PhD with very good results, results as in not the actual data or publications, but very good outcomes. And maybe you can touch later on, on that, on what are PhD outcomes. Um, yeah, so by involving myself with all of these different um, experiences and activities, I realized that I'd rather be out there chatting to people and helping people and doing things with people rather than being in the lab, closed in a small lab, doing my experiments and failing at them. Uh, and in this way, I tried to immerse myself more in the development of a skill set outside my expertise, which so far had been technical skills around chemical engineering and biocatalysis. And that's how my kind of involvement started. And then everything was brought together when I realized that there's this uh, idea of researcher's development. And I became so passionate about researcher's development because being a researcher at the moment, at the point, I thought, well, we're being taught on how to be good at lab work or how to use equipment or how to analyze data or whatever but we're not being taught on how to communicate or how to present our results or how to make the most out of conferences or how to build a network for afterwards because you're doing your research and you're doing it for three, four, five years or whatever, and then, then what? You're left alone to try to figure out what your next steps would be. Whereas if you have built a network, if you have had some other experience, it makes things so much easier to decide well, to build realization of who you are, what you want to do, and to decide what your next steps could be, and maybe facilitate your movement outside of your PhD towards a kind of more professional role. Um, that's how, how everything started. At the end of my PhD, at the, the last year of my PhD, I was still a teaching assistant, and I decided to assist with a module which was named Skills for Employability in my department. And the idea behind this module was to introduce students, undergrad students, onto, onto their employability and what it means and how they can develop their employability, how they can like, identify their skills, technical and transferable, how they can build uh, an asset management for themselves, like a portfolio of, of experience, how they can improve their experience, how they can manage the job hunting process, interview process, everything. Uh, so I became a teaching assistant at that and everything clicked and I realized that's what I want to do. Employability is my thing, talking to people about skills and development and how to become better and how to help themselves and how to maybe realize that it's not like careers are not a straightforward road. That's what I want to do with my life. And that's what I tried to do. And so far, it's been a very, very rocky road. But right now, I'm a teaching associate for employability in my department where I did my PhD. It wasn't easy to get here, to get where I am. 
And my transferable skills and my experiences outside of my education, my PhD, they helped me so much to get here. And I cannot stress that enough that people who have experiences outside their uh, education or like outside their um, assigned duties, if you want, they, their, their horizons are so broadened and they can do so much better. And they have a much better perception of, well, who they are, what they like and wh what's important out there. So that's my brief experience with transferable skills. Awesome. Yeah, that's that's really, really amazing. And your path to this point has been so cool. Um, you've done so much stuff. I'm like, oh my God, where to start? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I suppose one thing that I would be wondering about myself and maybe other people who are wondering about is how can you even start to develop all of these transferable skills? Like you mentioned so many different things that we can do, but how do you get into all that? It doesn't happen overnight and it doesn't happen over a semester if you want. And you need to be a bit of, you need to have self-awareness. You need to kind of be able to sometimes read between the lines because for example, you might be doing your masters as you just finished, for example, and then if someone asks, okay, what did your master's teach you? It's not just technical stuff. It's also how to do group work, how to write a technical piece of work, how to, maybe, I don't know if you participated in conferences or if you disseminate your research in a more public audience, how to disseminate your research, how to communicate with different audiences. So if you think on the broader aspect of what you've done so far, regardless of if it's just your studies or any other experience, if you think on the broader uh, perspective, then you can identify the transferable skills and when exactly you've been taught them and how you how you like build build them. And the more you do, the more you participate in experiences that allow you to like develop your skills, the better you'll become at it. It's not something that you do once and then you're an expert. The first time I communicated something, the first time I presented something. It was in my undergrad, during my undergrad, I think third year or whatever. And I was so scared. I was trembling. It was supposed to be something that I've been working on with a team. It was supposed to be easy and whatever. But it was my first time presenting. And I was so, so, so scared. And now at this point, after having been through so many presentations during my PhD on technical topics, during my PhD on science communication and outreach um, opportunities, outside of my PhD, completely different things. Now that I've been developing a portfolio of um, doing chats like we're doing now, if you ask me to present, I'm like, yeah, okay, doing it fine, absolutely fine. So it takes it takes some time, takes some personal investment and it takes some effort. Yeah, it's, it's not easy, but once you've developed skills like that, I don't wanna say you're set for life and create hopes for people, but it's so much easier to move ahead, to move further ahead compared to people who don't have these assets. Awesome. So um, basically, a lot of us already have some transferable skills. We just don't maybe don't know about it, or we're not thinking about our the work that we do in the right way. Yes, um, that's usually what's happening. Yeah. Cool. So we can just sit down and think about every skill that could possibly relate to what we've been doing is the best way to find is what will is a way to find transferable skills and then maybe if you're not so sure about it ask some people <laughs> absolutely another great way is to simply google them there are like lists of tens i don't want to say hundreds but tens of transferable skills and also another great way of identifying transferable skills that are important are is to Look at job descriptions that I guess that people are might be somewhat aware of what roles they'd be interested in. If they look up job descriptions around these areas, they will see what the employer is looking for. And usually they're looking for a bit of technical expertise in some area. And the majority of the candidate profile is built around transferable skills. So I've seen in my current role as a teaching assistant on employability where I'm teaching the module of employability. I'm helping students with uh, job descriptions and job excuse me, uh, the job hunting process. 
So we're going through job descriptions, trying to identify all the keywords, all the candidate profile, like important information. And majority of employers are looking for candidates with good employability skills, transferable skills. They obviously care about the base, base level of technicality, but what the most important, what the most important bit is transferable skills. And what I see a lot, especially for engineering jobs, they do care about teamwork, they do care about leadership, they do care about the ability to communicate with different stakeholders. And majority of students in all curriculums, they're, um, they've been given opportunities to work in teams, to communicate, to disseminate their work, to communicate their research or findings or group projects or whatever. So it's a matter of you identifying all these opportunities you've had in your um, experience, career, whatever you want to call it so far, to tap on these skills and then showcasing your experience in a way that comes across. Because if you just say, yes, of course, I have communication skills, obviously, very good for you. But if you don't pass the message to the employer on how you're having on your actual experience, on the evidence, it's, it's not going to be good for you for the application process. Interesting. Yes. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I'm just thinking about my own experience and I'm like, maybe I need to go revisit my CV. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> so um, how can you get these across to the employer? Like, how can you make sure that communication, let's say, for example, is on your CV when you are going, is in your cover letter, is in on your LinkedIn, how can you make sure that this is going, getting across? That's, that's a great question. It all has to do with evidence. And also it all has to do with how you're presenting your evidence. As I said before, just saying that you know how to do something or you have a skill is not enough. You need to prove it. And the first step of proving it is provide some evidence into your uh, application. The second step is if you're invited for an interview, they will probably ask you to prepare an activity, some sort of presentation, or depending on the role you're going for, they might ask you they might ask you to prepare something. And that's another great way for you to evidence your expertise and your skills. So talking about the applications now, uh, a way to evidence is to showcase examples of how you've applied the skill and how, how you developed the skill initially and then how you've applied it. For example, if you're talking about communication, um, if, if we're having a, an average student of an undergrad um, course somewhere on any discipline, a great way to evidence communication would be through uh, projects they've done during the undergrad where they had to prepare a presentation, where they had to answer questions, where they had to, to get a point across. And then if they can provide that they prepared a report, for example, and they got great feedback on their communication skills, that's evidence. If they didn't get great feedback on their communication skills, that's probably a different skill we can talk about later down uh, the point, which is on how, how you take feedback on and you use to improve yourself. Um, in your case, based on like what I know so far about you, you can evidence your communication skills uh, by stating your, uh, your master dissertation, which is a technical form of communication. And also by saying that you've been hosting this, uh, this podcast where you help people draw their ex experience and expertise out. For example, what you're doing right now with me is you're kind of interviewing me and then I'm getting a message across on whatever I want to talk about. And that's you facilitating communication. That's very fair. And I'm sure so many people have so many different examples of science communication they've done of conferences they've been to of Absolutely. presentations yeah. they've given in modules in classes in presentations they've given to their department so many different examples <laughs> and you know it, it might come across intimidating because when you're looking at a job description it says communication skills you might think oh my god I, I don't have what they want I don't know what they want so clearly I don't have it uh, but as you said it, majority of us have had experience with communication before and as you said, especially for people um, later on in their careers, maybe uh, doing masters or PhDs, we've had experiences where we had to go to conferences and showcase what we've been working on. Or we've had experiences where we had to disseminate results in group meetings and explain to other fellow researchers what, what we've done. 
or even with uh, publications. It's a form of, of very technical high level communication. So we do have the experience, but more often than not, we're not aware that we, that we have it and we don't know exactly how to showcase it. And that's where we're losing the game. Very, very true. Um... I know so many people that do so many awesome things. And then when it comes there to say, creating a CV or talking about examples, they don't, they don't use so much of the experience that they have. They just kind of see it as something that everybody has when it's not necessarily that. Exactly, that's, that's such a valid point. Yeah, you think that, oh, I'm doing, this, I'm doing this thing, which means that a lot of other people are doing this thing. Not necessarily. And that's, if you're, if you're applying for a job or whatever, it's just you against the employer, not against trying to persuade the employer. And you cannot say like, oh, well, I'm not gonna write that because everybody else would have, read, would have written that. You don't know that. You're just trying to put your, yourself in the best way possible across. And you need to use everything that you have in your arsenal. And also another kind of important point is a lot of people have different experiences, for example, sticking with communication. They might have different experience with communication, but you need to decide as an applicant what's the most relevant for the role. Because of course you cannot showcase absolutely everything, especially for people who have lots of experiences. You need to decide what's the most relevant to put out there and stress for this role. There might be some experiences you've had which are more relevant for a particular role compared to another. And then it's your job to tailor the application accordingly. Absolutely. Um, I think that's something I struggle with tailoring. I'm like, there's so many different examples. And then I, I get very confused because obviously when we talk about research CVs, research CVs are very long and you kind of have... Yes everything on them and then when we go to the employee of the shorter cvs the two-page cv you only have your two pages and it's kind of like i want to put everything from my seven page cv onto the two-page cv and it doesn't work <laughs> let me correct you very quickly there you said that on research cvs they're very long you have to have everything on it yes but again the relevant bits and the relevant bits always should be going first on the top part of your CV or the initial part or whatever you want to call it. But yeah, it's, it can be confusing sometimes to identify what the relevant bits are, but it all becomes easier if you know how to read job descriptions and extract the useful information. Usually everything you need to know, it's there, but a lot of people, you, it's, if you don't have much experience or if you're not paying attention to detail, which is another very good transferable skill, uh, it's very difficult to identify what the employer wants. Sometimes some job descriptions are not written very well, but to my experience so far, I've been always able to extract useful information. Okay, when I say always, not always, because I've done my, uh, I've had my failure or whatever, whatever you want to call it in this department before. But as soon as I realized how the game is played, I became so much better at it. And it suddenly, everything makes sense and it's so much easier to guide myself through the process, but also to help people going through the process. And it's all about, as I said, identifying the important bits in the application and the keywords. And there are uh, different sections on, uh, on job descriptions, for example, what the company is, what they do, what the role is about. And then the most important section, the candidate profile, where the employer basically takes a, sna a snapshot of, a, of the successful candidate. So if you're able to read that and identify the key points, the most important points, and build an application which makes you like explains how you fit the candidate profile and why you're a good match for this particular role. There's nothing else that you can do after that. It's luck in a way, or maybe other circumstances. But from your point of view, you would have done the best that you could. That's very, very important advice. I think um, everyone listening should like write that down and maybe like put it up on the wall or something <laughs> just so that you're reminded that it's there. <laughs> um, but I guess um, going back to transferable skills, how can we, 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 we talked, you mentioned it earlier. So dealing with feedback and improving. So if we find that uh, one, there's a skill that we want to improve or maybe one that we're not so good at and we're like, I really need to work on this. 
how do we go about it and how can we find feedback if maybe necessarily we didn't get it? You ask for it, as simple as that. If you don't ask, you won't get. If you ask, you might get. And sometimes feedback can be delivered in ways which are not very constructive or very helpful. And then if you really want to improve and if it's important to you, then you go back to the person who gave you feedback and you ask for more, you ask for clarification. Or you, I don't know what type of feedback we're referring to, like if it's on an assignment and you're trying to improve your technical skills, you can always give a piece of your writing to someone else that you trust and they can give you some more feedback. Um, you can always ask people around your circles who know you and people who don't know you to give you feedback on a, on a particular thing that you're interested in. And then you collect all of that feedback and then you process it in a way that makes sense to you, obviously, in a way where you don't take the negatives too personally, but you try to see the point and you try to see how, how you can use all of that feedback to improve further or how you can um, pursue further, further uh, experience for that exposure to the areas that you think that you're weak. In my case, I did that both with presentation skills and I did that with um, hosting, organizing and hosting events. And I definitely did that with networking because before moving to the UK, I was a very shy person, still, I'm still a very shy person. But I'm, I'm trying to see the point of connecting with people and creating relationships so I can not necessarily get something out of it, but expanding my network because you never know who you're going to meet and you never know what they'll be working on and you never know when you're going to use um, that information. So far, based on my um, efforts with networking, I've I found them extremely rewarding. Sometimes it's daunting to just walk across the room and talk to people, but if you take it from a point of you're not exposing yourself or you're not opening yourself to judgment or at the end of the day, what's the worst that can happen? They might, in my case, they might not hear my voice because I have a very low voice. So what? I just speak a bit louder or I'll approach someone else. Yeah. So it's trying to see the positive from the feedback that you're receiving and then try to see how you can implement that to improve yourself. I think that's, that's really awesome. Um, yeah, networking is something that I think terrifies a lot of people. Um, it's something that uh, we're not really ever taught to do. Yes, yeah, that's that's correct. That's correct. There are, at least in my university, there are some, uh, at this point, webinars. But as we're coming out of the pandemic, there are more face-to-face -face options on how to network. Um, and I've been teaching a couple of lectures on how to network. And it, it is daunting. And I'm not saying that I'm a networking pro but I've definitely improved over the years. And I definitely remember occasions where I, said, I was telling myself, you have to talk to people or there's a person you need to meet, go talk to them. And I've been pushing, actively pushing students, almost physically pushing students to go talk to people in events. Um, and it's, it can be extremely rewarding. And as I said before, you never know what you're gonna get out of a connection. For me, I've had some, great outcomes for the most the most random uh, experiences for example and i still remember that i'm still telling the people and they're looking at me so i had a doctor's appointment and had gone with my mother because uh, i was young <laughs> no yeah uh, and we were sitting at the waiting room and there was this guy sitting next to us and my mom started chatting to him and at some point, she nudges me and says, oh, by the way, aren't you doing this project at university? I was a final year of uni. And I was like, yes, well, what's happening? And this guy was a professor in a different university in my city. And at that point, I was working on a project and we're looking for a host lab to go and perform some experiments. And this guy had the perfect opportunity for us and he was interested in helping us. So what we got was um, a short summer placement out of that. I was working with a group on something and it was the most random experience at the doctor's office. Who would have thought? Imagine what would happen when you go to a professional event somewhere. So yeah, just chat up to people and it, it doesn't have to be, you don't, you don't need to go with a mindset of, oh my God, I need to have my profile ready and I don't know what to ask me and I need to come across very this and that and the other and oh, they're so in a position of power and I'm so afraid. No, it, it, it can be very casual. It can be very 
um, definitely not unprofessional at any point, but it can be casual. You don't have to have prepared anything. And if you come across from a position of real interest, because you actually find the person interesting, what they've done interesting, or if it's a presenter uh, and you're interested in the presentation, you go and ask questions about that. That's a great, great, great and very easy starting point to initiate a discussion, a conversation, maybe have a follow up, maybe have a chat later on and then start building a relationship and then eventually ask what you need to ask. Very true. And I've never met a researcher who has not wanted to talk about their research. <laughs> so, so just asking people about their research, I think that's my default question, asking people about their research, because that's what I know. <laughs> yes, and that there are some kind of ice-breaking questions, for example, where are you from? What are you doing here, especially in conferences? Or as you said, what your research is about, and then trying to find the connecting points between them and you. Or you can always start with a compliment, for example, what nice hair color, and then you start chatting. Yeah, it's, it's very easy. If you think about it, it's very easy. But if you overthink about it, you create all of these barriers. Very true. Um, yes. I am definitely an overthinker. <laughs> Same here. Yeah. <laughs> I'm kind of, it's, it's, you know, sometimes you just stress yourself out. You're just like, I'm going to bother everybody, which is not necessarily the case because most of the time, most people are feeling exactly as you're feeling really awkward and they just want to talk to someone, but they're afraid to go up to people. <laughs> yeah. And where I'm coming from now that I'm, I've kind of crossed the bridge between from student to become a professional, what I'm saying with other professionals, lecturers and professors and much higher levels is that they're always excited to connect with the youngsters, with the students. So if they have people coming up to them, asking all sorts of questions or being interested or being engaged, there's nothing better. So it's, I guess my message is don't be afraid to reach out to people as long as you're polite because of course you can reach out in a much more awkward way. Uh, as long as you're polite and as long as you come across genuine, that's absolutely fine. That's, yeah, that's how things should be. Yes, sorry. I think we've, we, I, I've taken that a little bit off topic to my own, <laughs> um, <laughs> my own problems, but um, let's talk more about transferable skills in that, um, let me think how can i have so many questions where do i want to start um, <laughs> um so how can people make sure how's the best way to phrase this um sorry that's okay take your time um how can people figure out what they've already done from their outputs. So you mentioned earlier, PhD has specific outputs. Sorry, I kind of already asked this question. Mm, I think, I think I'm, I think I understand what you're trying to say there. So yeah, so in majority of people's minds, the PhD has specific outputs, for example, publications, for example, a thesis. But it's not just that. During a PhD, you're doing so much more things compared to just preparing a publication or just preparing a thesis. And if you think about all the skills you're acquiring during a PhD, and I'm not talking technical, it's a huge, huge, huge arsenal. And there are many examples during a PhD, during a PhD experience where you can showcase evidence for developing these skills. For example, critical thinking, problem solving. I mean, every PhD you ask, including myself for the most part, it's been, a huge race of solving problems. The project that I was given, it had problems. I mean, the project that I was given, it was a problem in itself. That's what research is about, trying to answer questions, which means that derived from projects, from problems, sorry. So problem solving there. Also, how many times a, a kit of equipment broke or didn't work or something happened and you had to solve that? Or how many times, um, I don't know, the reactions were bad. And I'm talking from an experimental point of view, but I'm sure that in every other case, every other PhD or research, they have their own problems. And then critical thinking, that's maybe, that's a, such a, an, an important transferable skill during a PhD. 
because what is research if not critically analyzing what you're like getting out of your experiments or critically designing your experiments to suit your project and suit the, the idea of your project and then what is research if you're not critically thinking about what has been done so far in the literature literature review speaking of literature review that's another way of saying that you've been conducting a market research so that's another skill and in phd academic term it's called literature review but in industrial terms or job hunting terms it's called ability to do market research so if you're not able to translate that skill that literature review skill to a market research skill you're missing out on a very important piece of evidence that you could be giving to, to support to strengthen your application other important skills during a phd are conflict resolution because i'm sure that a lot of uh, researchers have been there where the, there was some conflict with either other researchers in a lab or in a team or maybe their own supervisor or other people and then somehow you're resolving that and I'm sure that it would have happened multiple times. In my case, it, I don't want to say conflict as in like a big situation, but we've always had issues allowed, allowed, around how to use equipment or how often to use equipment. So if you're able to kind of manage people around these issues, then that's evidence of you managing conflict. Maybe another, uh, another skill is multitasking during a PhD because you have to do your own research you have to do the experiments or whatever type of research you're doing, collect the data. You have to, at the same time, write publications. You have, at the same time, prepare presentations. At the same time, go to conferences. At the same time, do any other admin job your supervisor gives you. At the same time, manage your life or do any other extracurricular activities. So that's your multitasking. And at the same time, doing project management. Doing a PhD is a huge project and you're managing it by yourself day in, day out, you have your de deliverables, you have your tasks, your um, like important periods or periods where you need support, and then you're managing all of that. And same goes with time management. As I said, during multitasking, you have to manage everything in 24 hours or per day or per week or per month or whatever. So again, if you put all these things down into perspective, you have great evidence to showcase your experience with these transferable skills. And then another area which is continuously growing is digital skills. And again, have, coming through a pandemic, hopefully finishing this pandemic soon, majority of us have developed um, a new kind of digital skill set in a way. And I won't become very technical and talk about coding skills or anything, which again, this is a different set of digital skills. I talk about presenting online or creating meetings online or using different meeting platforms, things like that. This can come under evidence for communication, but also for digital skills. So it's becoming aware of all these experiences and how they fit into what the employer wants. That's really awesome. And it's amazing how quickly you, you came up with so many different examples for so many different skills. <laughs> it probably would have taken me hours. Um, I've been talking about that a lot. <laughs> but it, it, it takes time and people can sit down or, like you said, Google <laughs> some skills and then figure out where they fit into their CV. Um, and um, let's say from my perspective, one thing that I struggled with was um, presenting. So I know you used this example earlier, but I was really, really poor at presenting, really, really nervous when I started, especially during my undergrad. So I have taken a lot of time, or I've spent a lot of time trying to take every opportunity I can to present. And that is at all levels. So that is true science communication. That is through social media. That is true this podcast <laughs> that is true um you know of opportunities at work so it's you can hone your skills in many different ways absolutely and that's a great great thing that you said a great example of taking initiative another skill or self-development another skill see it becomes easier the more you understand how things work it becomes easier and 
uh, you said that you were bad at something and then you immerse yourself into experiences to become better at it. What's more for an employer to ask? Even if you're not pro at communication, if you can showcase your trajectory and your um, ability to take initiative, that's great for someone to hire you on the promise that you can do so much better. So true. <laughs> and um, I guess we have been talking for a long time now, so we're nearly out of time. Is there anything else that you would like to bring in before we end? I guess what I would like to say is I would hope people would become more aware about the transferable skills and how important they are for their employability. And especially at PhD level, because that's kind of my side passion. Um, not all PhDs will end up in academia. Actually, it's like 20% or something like a very small number of PhDs resulting in academia in uh, academic roles relevant to their experience. So for the rest of us, and I'm putting myself in there and I'll explain why in a moment, uh, for the rest of us, we need to be aware of our skill set, our experience, our employability before we go out there looking for jobs. And our employability will not come from publications, it will not come from uh, the conventional PhD outcomes, it will come from everything else. Because unless we go for academic roles, publications don't really matter. There are some areas where publications matter because they're evidence of communication, like very technical R&D roles, but in the rest of the roles out there, nobody really cares about whether you published or which impact factor your journal had or whatever. So if you're pushing yourself forward by saying, well, I have a PhD and three publications in nature, very good for you, but they're not gonna hire you for that if you're going for industrial jobs. And I'm not putting, I'm not putting myself into as an academic because although I'm in academia, I'm, I came, I left and came back in a different way. And that's, that's fine. Well, that's, and I know that's fine because I'm doing it. Uh, but what I want to say through that is that you might have an idea of what you want to do in your life or what is the best thing for you or whatever. And things might not be as straightforward, as straightforward as you would wish. And that's absolutely fine if you can find a way to move forward, whatever forward means for everyone. Forward might mean doing a U-turn for what might mean doing like an in and out or whatever. But if you're aware about your skill set and if you're aware about your expertise, not only technical, then it's going to be so much easier to navigate a way forward with your career. That's really awesome. And um, yes, thank you so, so much for being a guest and for sharing all your amazing knowledge because this has been a really really awesome episode and I think it's an episode that I needed <laughs> because I am finishing my master's and need to figure out what I'm doing next <laughs> I'm glad so, I want to <laughs> thank you um so I guess one last question before we finish is where can people connect with you if they would like to talk more about this or see your other work uh, so I'm very active on Instagram. I do have a profile page, which is at Kerlenny. And I'm uploading lots of content there around employability, transferable skills, uh, academic and post-academic experiences, PhD experiences, mental health during a PhD, which is another very important issue. Uh, so I'm active on Instagram. And also I'm quite active on LinkedIn. And I do have a Twitter page as well, all of them under my own name. So if you Google if you search for Eleni Rutula, then you'll find everything. Uh, yeah, and I want to believe I'm a very approachable person. So if anyone wants to discuss more or anything, I'm up for these things. Awesome. We will put all of your connections in the description so people will be able to find them. Um, but thank you so much for being a guest. And this has been a really amazing episode. Um, this has been Grad Chat by PhD Balance. Our episodes are now posted simultaneously on our podcast and YouTube channel every second Saturday. You can connect with PhD Balance on our website at phdbalance.com or on social media on Twitter and Instagram at phd underscore balance. Until next time, goodbye and take care of yourself.